Hi there, thanks for listening in to the latest Ed Talks podcast. What I'm trying to do with the solo edition podcasts is vary between giving tips about what I think worked for me when I was in the estate agents industry, which I was for 37 years, and also with what sort of helped me get on. And I think today I'd like to focus on the things that helped me get on and get ahead of the game um, and become successful at what I did. And I think the thing to start by saying is that when you start off as an estate agent, I think it feels sometimes, I, I, it's highly likely that you'll feel a bit, what's the right word, at sea. In my last um, solo podcast where I talked about this, I talked about how um, estate agents can be everything from sort of marriage counsellors to guidance to salesmen to, you know, to all sorts of different jobs. None of which they're necessarily good at, but it can seem completely overwhelming to start with. And I think what I would say is if you're thinking, oh, my God, what am I doing? And frankly, at the moment, you're doing a job which is probably still recognised by the public as being on a par with politicians and you're not being paid very much because I don't think wages have gone up anything like as much as they have in some other industries. But stick with it and try and work out what you are good at. Because if, like me, you find it quite difficult to actually sell, and most people enjoy the processes, they enjoy... You know, when someone says they want to go and see something, there's something quite fun about getting out and going to see the property and showing somebody around, etc. Et there's a big difference between liking doing that and actually being able to close a deal, actually ringing somebody up and having that 5% shit that's required to say, right, are you going to sign or do I move on to the next person? And being an estate agent, it's very easy to get far too close to um, buyers and spend too much time running around after buyers who could be a complete waste of time, but you just happen to enjoy being with them. So take your time to try and find a bit of the industry that you enjoy. I mean, the fact of the matter is being a lettings agent is completely different from being a sales agent. You know, lettings agents don't tend to earn as much money, but it's more consistent and it's a more repeatable, repetitive job. Whereas sales agents can earn very large amounts of money, but it may be feast or famine. But stick with it and find what you're good at. Um, as I said in my last podcast, for me, I wasn't a terribly good salesperson, but what I discovered I was very good at was motivating. And the moment I discovered that, it was like a breath of fresh air. It really was. It took several years. It really took from the sort of late 70s until, frankly, the mid 90s for me to discover that. And I had many, many years in the meantime of what I would describe, describe as journeyman activity just just getting by and it wasn't until I started running an office that I started to think hang on a minute I can really do this and we started to make a lot of money so what makes assuming that you found what it is that you're good at and for, let's talk about the running of an office bit for a moment because that's the bit that I did and it's the bit where I can impart my experience when I started running an office by that time, I already knew the area I was working in very well. And I think there's a lot to be said personally in having people working in a business that know the area, particularly if they're going to be running an office and going out and valuing property where they know the area backwards. Really helps to be able to talk about experience. And I used to get people coming and going. It was a bit different in, in the 70s and 80s because people used to move very regularly because the stamp duty was, was negligible. Um, so you used to get the same people coming in every three or four years wanting to sell again. So once they knew where you were and what you were doing, they'd come and see you quite regularly. That's not the case these days with the average itch cycle, as we call it, well over a decade. But working in an area and getting to know it, there's no substitute for it. And you become part of the furniture, you become part of the local setup. So let's assume for a second that you know the area very well. How do you differentiate yourself from the other people who are doing the same thing you are in an area? And the fact of the matter is, there will be a lot of other nice people, nice, horrible word, very good people in the area, people who are capable people, who are, you know, they're, they're there to eat your lunch. So how do you differentiate yourself? Because, you know, people will remember you if you stand out. Now, for me, I had two particular things which helped me do that. One, I rode a motorbike when nobody else seemed to. 
Um, and that sort of differentiated me. So if you were in a situation where you turned up somewhere and people could see you turning up, they'd see you turn up on a bike, so they remembered you. And the other thing was that when I started doing it, when I started running an office and going out and trying to win, list, win listings in the 90s, um, everyone was wearing a suit. And to an extent, they still are. Um, and I made a conscious decision that I was going to wear a bright red fleece. Now, I was working in Chelsea, and when you saw someone arriving for a job or travelling around on a motorbike wearing a bright red fleece, it sort of tended to stick in people's memories. Now, we were a bit slow off the mark, actually, as a business, because we didn't realise for a few years how effective it was having a motorbike riding around as a billboard. So actually, over the last 10 years or so that I was there, we had a my motorbike was was done up with the with the Douglas and Gordon logo all over it. Um, quite tastefully, I have to say. It wasn't like another company I can mention that's actually just bought my old business, um, who were very obvious in their advertising. But it was quite clever and quite cool. And the main thing was that if you're a seller, prospective seller sitting in your property and you're interviewing people coming in, when someone walks in wearing a bright red fleece, there were probably half the people there that would go, no thanks, I want someone who's dressed in a suit. But for the other half, you know, they'll remember you. They'll go, oh yes, you, that was the guy wearing the red fleece. Um, I mean, there's so much talk these days of efficient ways of running a sales team, et cetera, et cetera, and that's fine. I mean, you know, my methodology for my sales team was to, was to let them get on with it and be there if they had any problems. and over a 22 year period running an office, I only had, really, I only had two teams. They only sort of changed over once during that period and working with the same people. And, and those people that I work with are now running successful businesses themselves. Now, I hope a little bit of what I taught them has rubbed off on them, but everyone has their own success stories. But for me, it was a combination of, um, knowing the area backwards, and I still do. If I drive around Chelsea, you know, I know, I, I mean, how on earth taxi drivers do it? And they, they know the whole of London as well as I knew Chelsea, Kensington, some of Battersea, Fulham, Wandsworth, those sort of areas. But I did know those areas backwards. A combination of that and standing out from the crowd meant that we, I got asked in quite a lot. Now, one of the other things I was very lucky with uh, and I didn't know this until we, and I have to give credit actually to Ivor Dickinson, who I work with, who was wonderful. He thought about the possibilities of using PR and it wasn't something that had really been done much before. So we employed um, a PR agency and it was a huge success for me personally and for the business insofar as I like to think I've got a decent brain and a very good PR business found that they could use that brain of mine to persuade journalists that not all estate agents were the same. And so I ended up with a lot of journalists coming to me for objective opinion. And I had quite a lot of fun sort of creating my persona. I remember I spent a whole day driving around with Annabelle Hesseltine on the back of my motorbike when she was working for the Telegraph and did a big piece and things like that. It was it was highly entertaining. Now, I rather sort of flippantly say talk here about PR, but actually PR is one of those things that not everyone's good at. A lot of people freeze when a microphone or a camera is shoved in their face and, and I don't. But nevertheless, it's something which is well worth pursuing. And I think that success in PR is, I don't think should be measured in column inches. I think there, there are some very irritating PR businesses out there that just shout about how many column inches they get. And it's just rubbish. People will judge you on your output um, and they will see through it if you're talking bollocks, if you'll pardon my French. So finding somebody from within your organization who can talk sensibly and has got the time, most importantly, to talk sensibly, is well worth doing. I remember one of the biggest agencies in the UK really struggled. None of their senior staff either enjoyed or was particularly good at doing the PR side. So this business ended up having to find somebody in a very rural office 
to do it who was very successful and that person has now gone on to have a very successful career themselves and that's not an uncommon story so you need to find someone that's not just good at making a lot of noise but someone who is uh, considered and frankly knows what they're on about and it's 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 really important but PR is very very undervalued I think it's often misused and there aren't many good people out there so if you want some advice on that I'm very happy to give it because I think it's a it's an area that a lot of people particularly agents who've been in areas for a very long time and know that area backwards there's a whole industry that's got up around data and supplying data and opinions about people living in the area and you if you read a lot of the articles and the stuff on LinkedIn, they say, oh, yes, you need to produce good content and people really want to read it. And people want to know what the value of their house is. I think people are quite keen to look at different things and different angles. Talk about stuff that you enjoy and stuff that you're good at in your area. Don't try and be all things to all people. Um, and certainly... From my point of view, when I was talking to a lot of the journalists back in the sort of 90s and the noughties, um, I would say things exactly as they were. I think a lot of agents just simply say, yeah, it's a great time to buy, which clearly it isn't always a great time to buy, but say the truth. You know, I don't think you'll find many clients or potential sellers will say, well, I read you in the Times last week saying that you think the market's crashing. Well, you know, any, any sensible PR person is ever going to use the expression crashing. Because again, it's just bollocks. People, the press talks about things crashing or soaring and there's nothing often in between when you, the listener, and I both know that the truth is, is exactly in between normally. Things go slightly up or down. They don't often crash or soar. Um, but I think that it's, uh, it's just always worth telling the truth. And... Try and establish yourself as try and establish yourself, as I said, as a as a slightly colourful character in your area. You know, a slightly unusual car or whatever it is. I think the business the business can be very straight, but I think property people buy an individual. They yes, the image of the business may get you through the front door, but once you've got through the front door, you've got to differentiate yourself from your other highly capable, often competitors. And for me in particular, I was working in what I consider I was working in Chelsea for all that time, which I think had some of the best agents. And actually um, at Douglas and Gordon in Chelsea, we were very much up against John D. Wood and Foxton's, who were the other ones principally in what I would describe as the upper end flat market. They also have good house departments, but from our point of view at D&G, we were very much upper end flat agents. And we thoroughly enjoyed that. It was an area, a niche that I knew and understood. So find out what you're good at as an estate agent. Don't be afraid to differentiate yourself and concentrate on that bit you're good at. And I can't believe with all of those things in place, you shouldn't end up making a very good um, success of your career. So um, if any of that makes any sense or you would like to talk to me a little bit further, um, please get in touch. Thanks very much.